to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. I'm going to ready to serve you with those. I don't think we may get done with it tonight, but I'm not so sure. But we will see. We've got to next year. Luke chapter 2. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. I'm going to ready to serve you with that. Lessons on Christmas character part 2. Lessons on Christmas character, part two. Looking at some of the major characters in the Christmas story and taking just two aspects of their character, just two aspects that we see from the, the scriptures to help us to look at their life. I'm glad God gives us the lives of the people to study, both the good parts and sometimes the not so good parts of their lives so we can be on guard. But in the Christmas story, we find most of God is dealing with just the good of these folks in the Christian Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse number 22. Luke 2, 22. Let's begin verse 21. Luke 2, verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us now thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to light the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, as we repeat it. She was of great age and had lived with the husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about four score and four years. Which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong, and the spirit filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Father, help us tonight, Lord, as we look at just some people that you've revealed to us, some insights you've given to us of these people. You've recorded for our instruction. You've recorded for our edification. You've recorded for us to help us. Lord, I pray that you help us tonight as we look at this one. You've already spoken to me, as you always do. But as we look at these characters and the character of these people, we might be changed. We might be encouraged. We might start the week or continue the week and start the new year a little stronger. We would otherwise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You see? Again, looking at the character of these folks, that we can be such that God can use us, that we can be vessels ready in God's hand, that we can be used like God would want to use us. By way of review, uh, we saw Sunday, as we looked at these folks, this Christmas character, and how to have this character. We saw Mary, first of all, was a had character of purity and submission. Purity and submission. Oh, we haven't forgotten that. God looks to his people to be pure. God looks to his people to be right. God looks for his people to keep themselves clean and true. But also a, a heart and a character of submission. Submitting yourself to the Lord and submitting yourself to her husband. So Mary's a wonderful character trait for us. Then we saw Joseph. Joseph, we saw by way of review, he was a man of patience. Patience. He waited on God. Tragedy came to his life, at least as he saw it at that point, as his spouse's wife was praying for the child. He knew it wasn't his. It was a man of righteousness and holiness that she was supposed to be. And here she was with a child. 
But instead of immediately going out and stoning her or sitting her way, he thought on those things. He waited on God. And then we found his security. He was a man of security. He was secure in his Lord. But God said he did, and that was enough for him. When God said he said, that's enough. I can follow God. I can obey God. I will do what he wants me to do in spite of what challenges may come, in spite of what others may say, in spite of what others may look at me as. I'm just going to follow God. Boy, that is a wonderful trait for all of us. We will just be secure in God. You know, unless you want to be here and bring in the new year, I need you to talk back to it, all right? A little amen, as we talk about. So Joseph, a man of patience and security. And then we saw the shepherds. The shepherds were people who had character of position. In other words, divine position. They were in position God placed them. And then they were in position by duty, just doing what they were supposed to do. And then we saw they were also had characters of soul winners. Soul winners proclaiming the word. Well, tonight we're looking at two, maybe three others tonight, but we'll see how the Lord allows us to go. Number one, we're looking at Simeon. Simeon. And the, God doesn't tell us a lot, but there's a lot there about Simeon that we can glean from it, that we can look at our own lives. First of all, in Simeon, we see his character was prophecy founded. His character was prophecy founded. In other words, his character was based around prophecy that God had revealed to him. Look again, if you would, at verse number 25. And said, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon got his prophecy from two places. He got it from the Scriptures. Because we know he was looking for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for the Christ. That's what it's referring to. So he was looking for the Christ that God had promised that as all Jews were looking for, for him. So he got it from the scriptures, but he also got it from the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit told him, he says, you're not going to die until you see the Christ. We don't know when he saw, when he heard that. We don't know when the Holy Spirit told him that. It could have been days, weeks, months, years before Jesus showed up there in the temple. But he knew. So the Holy Spirit revealed it to him. And the scriptures reveal it to him. For us, we get prophecy from one place. That's the scriptures. That's from the scriptures. We get it just from that. First Peter 1, verse 18. As Peter was telling people, he said that he how he had been there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He heard Jesus. He saw Moses. He saw Elijah. He said, I heard the voice from heaven speaking about Jesus Christ. He said, I heard with my own ears. So in 1 Peter 1, 18, he says, and this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. He said, more than our ears, more than what we heard, more than what we saw. Whereunto ye do well take heed unto a light that shineth in the dark place until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So we get our prophecy, our look at the future from the scriptures. Aren't you glad we're still in the book? We, we see many Old Testament prophecies and some New Testament prophecies come, were given, and fulfilled. But we see also those prophecies are yet to be fulfilled. So we're looking for those things. So we have prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Just as Simeon had prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Looking for the Christ. Looking for the Messiah. Looking for the consolation. And we know he was not going to die before then. So he had the scriptures and revelation of the Holy Spirit. We have revelation of the scriptures by the Holy Spirit, but nothing new outside of the scriptures. Now, what's vital for us to understand then is we have in our hands what God wants us to know. And we should let that knowledge mold our character, not just the history. But what is yet to come, that ought to mold our character. That ought to help us structure our character, who we are and what we're about, because we know the prophecy God has given to us. Just like Simeon, so must we. So, for example, in Simeon's life, his character was reflected in his living. This prophecy was reflected in his living. It says he was a devout and just man. In other words, he lived right. He lived true. He lived holy. Why? Because he was waiting for the coming of Christ. Because he wasn't going to die before he saw Christ. And so his character, this character based upon the prophecy, 
was reflected in his living. So should the prophecies we know reflect in our living. Our living, we should live based upon what we know what is yet to come. We don't have to live just based upon what happened. We don't have to live based upon what they told us. We can need to live based upon the prophecy of what is yet to come. That's why the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall meet melt with fervent heat. The earth also, the works that they're in, shall be burned up. He said, we know that's yet to happen. We're still here. The earth is still here. But it's going to be burned up. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to melt away. And he goes on saying, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. He said, knowing this prophecy, knowing these things are going to be dissolved, knowing the heavens are going to be destroyed, knowing this earth is going to pass away, knowing that, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness? In other words, just like Simeon, who was devout and just and right and pious because of the prophecies that he knew while he was waiting, looking for the Spirit, the coming of Christ, so we know we ought to live holy and just and righteously in this world because we know what's coming. Oh, what a difference it will make in our life if we wake up every day saying this could be the day that Christ comes, and we look ahead at what's coming. How should I live based upon the prophecy that's yet to be and so in his life, it was reflected in his living. Secondly, prophecy reinforced his waiting. It reinforced his waiting. Did you ever get tired of waiting? Those 15 seconds on the microwave get longer every year. I mean, it's just, just amazing. Just how long is that going to take? We begin to check our watches. Is my microwave broken? How long is that? And so it is that sometimes as Christians, we get a little tired. We shouldn't, but we do get a little tired of waiting. Wait for the Lord. Wait for God to move. Wait for God to answer prayer. Wait for God to do what we expect Him to do, and even the things He's promised to do. So the question comes based upon even that thought. How can we keep on going on in these perilous times? How can we keep struggling on in these lukewarm times, in these trying times, in these difficult times, how can we just keep going when things look like we're going farther away from God and people are getting colder and colder to the gospel and Christians are getting more and more lukewarm and more and more backslidden and things just more and more like we're, how can we keep going? What's going to help us wait is prophecy. The character of knowing that prophecy is there and what's coming that will help us in our waiting. Notice what it says in verse 25 for for Simeon. And behold, this man was, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, that's how he lived, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And so we find the fact he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. In other words, he was waiting for the Christ. What kept him waiting was Christ was coming. For him, it was the first coming. For us, what ought to help us in our waiting is he's still yet to come the second time. That ought to help us day by day just keep looking up. Day by day just keep waiting. Day by day. Our character needs to be prophecy founded and it will help reinforce our waiting on the Lord. That's why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had to leave. How that you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So that salvation delivers us from not just hell, but also the, the tribulation times, but it says to wait for his Son. So knowing the prophecy, God ought to reflect in our living. Be just, be holy, be just to preach. Why should I live this way? Because we know what's coming. Why should I live pure? Why should I worry about being just and right with my neighbors and my boss and my company and my coworkers? Because we know what's coming, even as Simeon did. But also, it just helps us just keep waiting. Preacher, how long should I wait? Until he comes. How long do we go to look on? Just until he comes. So we're going to have to have a reinforce in our waiting. He was waiting for the consolation of Christ. He was also waiting for his departure. For his departure. Verse 26, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Verse 29, 
And now he's praying after he saw Christ. He said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Wait for his departure. He said, oh, I can go now. I can go now. Our waiting for our end of our life are to be reinforced by the prophecies that we're living for. That's why the Bible says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, henceforth laid unto me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. So he was ready for his departure. The prophecy that he was looking for, the prophecy reinforced his waiting, and he tell he was ready to go home. Ladies and gentlemen, we can have encouragement to help us in our waiting before we go home, knowing the fact that Christ is coming, and rewards are available, opportunities to serve are available, and the time to give God the glory is available, and it should help us and reinforce our waiting. Preacher, how can I just keep going? I'm just so worried. Look for the prophecy. We're living for the prophecy. He's coming, and rest is coming sure and soon. So we see his character. His character was prophecy founded. He lived his life based on what was coming. If, it, if we get nothing else out of the study tonight from Simeon, let's live based upon what's coming. You can't live based upon what's past or what you hope, but what is coming. Secondly, we find his character was also spirit man. It was spirit man. The Holy Spirit fanned his life, fanned his heart, and fanned the fire within him. Look at verse 26. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Don't you think he was excited about that? The Holy Spirit says, you're going to see the Messiah. You're going to see the one you're waiting for. Lots of folks waited, but never got to see. Lots of folks talked and preached about it, but never got to see. But he says, you're not going to die until you can see by revelation. So the Holy Spirit fanned his life and fanned his spirit and fanned him by revelation. Now, we don't get new revelation, but we get revelation, we get the book revealed to us. Are you out there tonight? When's the last time you opened up and all of a sudden you saw something for the first time? You saw what God was telling you for the first time. You've read it before, you've seen it before, you may have even had it preached before, but it just didn't seem to click. It just didn't seem to burn in your heart. It just didn't seem to be applying you. And one day, as God put you in a certain circumstance, God put you in a certain place, you read it, and the Holy Spirit revealed the truth about God's Word to your own heart and life. That'll change your life. That'll build your character. That'll help your character stay true and right. See, because when we know the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit reveals the Word of God, to us, that helps us mold our character to be more and more like Jesus Christ. When the Spirit, by revelation, comes. Our character is also spirit man by revelation, but also through leading by the Holy Spirit. Verse 27. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when his parents brought in the child Jesus to do for them after the custom of the law, then he took them up in his arms. I want to thank this day so we can see. What if he had been walking in the Spirit? But it says, today, I'm, not, I'm just not going to be too concerned about following the Spirit. Today, I'm just going to, after all, it's just a little bit after Christmas. Are you out of shit? It was Christmas. It was a week or so after Christmas, just not long after Christmas. And now he said, because, it, you know, it's just Christmas. I'm going to stay home with faith. I'm not going to go to the temple today because, after all, we've got all this turkey to eat. We've got all this going on. I'm just, he done missed what he was waiting for. How many times, if we're not careful, we'll miss the things in our life because we're not being led of the Spirit. Now, you're here tonight, and praise the Lord for that. And that's where the Spirit would have you come, I guarantee it. When we're walking in the Spirit and obeying the Spirit, living and obeying the Spirit, we will have a good and exciting character right? that will strengthen us when we're just being led by the Spirit. Oh, the character of Simeon, we find he was prophecy founded. His character was founded upon cross. He said, I know something's coming. I know what's coming. And so my life and my anticipation and my waiting is based upon the prophecies of the Word of God. Jesus Christ is coming. Crowns are going to be available for us. We'll give an account for, for Christ of what we've done in this life. Based upon that prophecy, that will dictate and help us mold our character. His character was prophecy founded and the spirit banned. 
based upon revelation of the Holy Spirit and on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Oh, when we get away from the Spirit, we get away from the prophecy, we get away from the book, our character will begin to crack. Our character will begin to weaken. So we find the character of Simeon. Secondly, we find the character of Anna. Of Anna. Folks that say, well, I'm too old now to be a blessing. No, no, at all. And how old was Anna? Talk to me, blessed. At least, how old? She's at least 84. No, it's blessed. She's a blessed us tonight. Look, what, look, let's look about Anna, verse 36. There was also one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phil, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age. And lived with the husband seven years for virginity. So in other words, she was a virgin when she got married. She lived with him for seven years. And she was a widow of about four score and four years old. Four years. And so she was a widow. So she was, whether she was 84 or she was a widow for 84, she's old. So she became a widow probably seven years. So she lived with her husband seven years. He must have died. And she became a widow of 40, four score and 40, so 84 years. Which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. And she coming in in that instant gave thanks likewise in the Lord and spake of him to all that look for the redemption in Jerusalem. So we find some character traits about Anna, this elderly lady, this old lady, this old widow. And God blesses us by teaching us about her character. That we can be blessed also. Notice very quickly, her character was peculiar. It was peculiar, and by that I don't mean strange. By that I mean unique. Unique. Peculiar means unique. It was just unique to her. Notice what it says about her in verse 36. And there was one man. That would be one man. Amen. So God really, it's not just man. It was the one. It was the one. She had a uniqueness about her. By the way, your character is unique to you also. Your stage of character, your development of your character, the strength of your character, the aspects of your character, how God has made you, is unique to you, as it is unique to me. God's made us all different. He's given us the picture of Jesus Christ to be molded into his character, but we're all different in the gifts and the talents and the abilities God has given us. So her character was peculiar, this one Anna, verse 36. And it was one Anna. See, it's kind of like Job. Remember in Job 1, verse number 8, the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like you in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and is true as evil. So, what's unique about your character? What's unique about what God's doing in your life? What's unique about you? Can you is there anything God would say, there's one? There's one. We find her character was peculiar. It was unique. Why? Because her character, number one, was impacted by her past. Her character was impacted by her past. More than her present, more than her future, we see it was her past that God revealed to us. First of all, we see how, how she prepared in her past. How she prepared in her past. Notice she was, this is verse 36, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Benal, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. So if nothing else, we know of her purity going into her marriage. She was a virgin when she got married. She kept herself pure. She kept herself right. She had a character trait of being living right as a young woman. And again, as we talked about Mary, by the way, we need to be reminded about that all the time in this world. In this world where the idea of purity, where the idea of virginity, where the idea of keeping yourself for your spouse to come is ridiculed and diminished and, 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 look, and torn down. We need to magnify it. Amen. We need to lift up. Dad's mom, don't be afraid to start talking to your daughters very early and say, well, keep yourself right. Keep yourself pure. You don't have to go into all the details when they're young, but you have to talk to them about just being right. Keep yourself right. Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself. Don't get, just keep and We get training it, but don't wait till they're 18. Don't wait till they're 16. You start early. Here she was. She was a virgin, so she was prepared. But notice how she was impacted by her past. So she prepared, but I want you to notice how she responded to her past. She was a great age, verse 36, and lived with the husband seven years from virginity. So apparently her husband, she was only married seven years before he died. Most folks are looking at that and that's not fair. Carol and I have been married now over 45 years. 
Some have been married longer than that. But just seven years, it's over. A lot of people say, that's not fair. I quit. If that's how God is, I'm not going to care about it anymore. If that's how God is, I'm not going to serve him anymore. If that's how God is, I'm just going to, just going to stop. And notice what she did. Instead of quitting, she turned her life into a serving Christ. She turned her life into a serving God. That's her testimony. So her life was a life of service. But her life of service here was in spite of the fact that she was only married for seven years. Only in the fact that somehow her husband died after that. She got widowed, but she didn't quit. She turned her life and heart to serve God. Ladies and gentlemen, when life gives us a tough time, when life gives us things that we don't think is fair, when life brings things in our life and say, I just don't think it's fair, we can either get better or better. The whole idea is just trust God. Amen. Trust God knows what he's doing and then say, now, God, this is where I am. How can I give you the glory? God, this is how I am. What can I do for you? God, this is what you are going to trust me. What can I use to do now? That I could not do before. We know even the Apostle Paul talked about if you're married, you've got to take care of your spouse. If you're married, you've got to take care of your wife. He said, I wish everybody was like me. In other words, the single city who just gets his entire life. He didn't have to worry while he's in prison who's taking care of the wife and kids. He didn't have to worry while I'm a shipwreck. I wonder who's going to have a wife. No, he said, I can give my life to it. He said, that not everybody can do that. He said, that's not for everybody. He says, but he said, that's what his life is about. So you and I find ourselves. We lose, we lose something. Don't be mad at God. Say, okay, what can I do now? That maybe I couldn't do before. How can I minister like I maybe couldn't do before? I have a certain heartache. I have a certain disease. I have, I've lost a limb, something like that. Say, okay, God, what can I do now for you that I could not do before? So we find her character was impacted by her past. Yes, her preparation, but also her response. So notice what it says to Jesus. Verse 37, she was a widow. Of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. Her character was impacted by her past. Secondly, her character was implied by her place. Her character was implied by her place. Notice what she said. And departed not from the temple. I'd say she was a church lady. I mean, that's one of the things they do. You know, she, she was there all the time. She was always showing up there. The she was always there, part of the church, if you will, uh, put it in modern language. She was just always there. She departed not. She was there all the time. It, people, people may not know that was Anna. They'd say, you know, the, 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 old, the old lady that hangs around the church all the time. <laughs> the old lady that's always cleaning the church all the time. The old lady that always making the call. What's her name? Who is that? She was just there all the time. She was there to minister. She was there to help. She was there to be involved. She, she was, so her character was implied by her place. She was the church lady. She was the temple lady. Ladies and gentlemen, our character is also implied by our places. By where we go. We know some folks in our, in our life, maybe some folks in your workplace, they are known by the taverns they go to. They are known by the rock concerts they magnify. We know by the sports teams they continually go after. I want to be known. I, if you will, I want my character to be implied by the church. The fact that I'm a church man. Oh, you don't have to be a pastor to be a churchman. Hello? Church people. Christian people. Baptist people. That's our crowd. So we should hold to to that and help that be part of our character. Our character. So her character was impacted by our past. Don't let your character be hurt by your past. Let your character be strengthened by your past. Whether it be good and God giving you a blessing all your life and everything seems to be going fine up to this point, everything's going well and everything has been good in God, use that in your character. Let God build your character in that. But if it's been hard, if it's been difficult, if it's been what we would think of fair, let God use that in your life to build your character. Character is unique. See, your past is different than mine. Your issues have been different than mine. God wants to use those in your life to make your character unique, peculiar, and he can use you. Her character was peculiar and was unique. Her character revolved around her service, around her service. Look at it again. Verse 37, she was a widow of about four score and four years, 
which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord when she saw the Christ and spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. We can find that her service, she had a service of prayer. She had a service of prayer. I mean, she just gave herself continually to serving the Lord in prayer. That's why in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, we hear about the house of Stephanus. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I mean, they were just addicted to it. It was just part of the life. In other words, they got up, if they couldn't serve the saints here at the house of Stephanus, they just, they had withdrawals. They just were suffering with cross. They were addicted themselves to it. When's the last time you felt withdrawals from not being able to pray, serve God, and look at your Well, she was always there. She had her service of prayer. I mean, she was a widow for 84 years. She probably couldn't have been scared to let her work the nursery. I don't know. Probably couldn't do past the power for me, but she could pray. But she could pray. Her service of prayer. Notice what it says about it. Verse 37. To serve God with fastings and prayer. Well, I hope you look at your prayer life as serving God. Not just serving yourself. Not just trying to get stuff. Not doing a religious ritual. But serving God. But serve God with fastings and prayer. Her service was a prayer. Her service was persistent. Notice what it says. Night and day. Night and day. I mean, you can catch her at night. You can catch her during the day. She was praying and serving God and fasting. Just be persistent. See her character involved around service. Serving God. It was persistent. And her service was to people. To people. Notice what it says. And spoke of him to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. She decided she was going to talk to people. So she was serving people. Because somebody who was looking for about the Lord, interested in Jesus Christ, interested in the Messiah that was coming, they said, I'm going to speak to him. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to encourage him. I'm going to teach him. So she had her character revolved around her service of prayer, of persistence, night and day, never quitting, and her service to people. What if her character revolved around service? Where, what does your character revolve, revolve around? What does my character revolve around? Is it my own pleasure, my own things, or is it the service of God? Matthew chapter 2. We're going to go ahead and finish this, and we'll be quick. We'll be quick. Matthew chapter 2. So we saw Simeon. We learned about his character. We saw Anna. We learned about her character. Let's look at the Magi, Magi and learn about their character. The wise men. Matthew chapter 2. We won't spend a great deal of time, but we want to close these fellows out as well. The Magi. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, now we know the story, but we'll read three parts of it. In the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he born, king of the Jews? We have seen a star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And we know the story. We drop down to verse number 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when he had found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw at the east, went before them, till they came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense and mirth. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Very quickly tonight, the character of the Magi. Number one, they were men, we got to catch this, I had to catch this, of perception and performance. Perception and performance. Here's the key it was both. Are you listening to me? It was both perception and and performance. They said, we saw, and they came. They saw, and they came. Talk to the They saw, and then what did they do? They came. See, what, how sad it would be. Say, well, we saw it, but we didn't bother. We saw it, but we didn't sacrifice. We saw it, but we didn't put ourselves out. We saw it, but it didn't change us. No, they were both in perception 
and performance. They saw and they come. Once we understand, once God shows us some things and we perceive some things in the Word of God, we must act upon it. We must respond to it. We must let God change us. How sad it is when we, God reveals things from His Word, but we do not act upon it. When we reveal it, we must act upon it. There's no performance. A lot of times we try to perform without perceiving. Way too often we perceive without performing. Verse 2, we have seen his stuff in these and our time. They saw it and they came. Perception and performance. Luke 8, verse number 20. And it was told him by certain who said, Thy mother, speaking about Christ, thy mother and thy brother stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said to them, My mother and my brother are these which hear the word of God. And do it. He didn't say, My brother and my mother are those that hear the word of God. Period. They hear the word of God and what else? Do it. See, it's perceiving, it's the knowing, it's the hearing, and the doing. So if we're going to be, catch that character of the, of, of the Magi, we have to perceive and perform. So they were men of performance and perception. They had studied, they learned, they knew, they saw the nature, they saw the star, they saw all the signs, they knew the scripture, because the scripture talked about the star. And so they said, well, we understand, now's the time. But then they performed, they acted upon it. So I challenge you, every time God reveals something to you from his word, from the pulpit, or your own prayer time, act upon it. It's perception and performance. Number two, they were men of not just performance and perception, they were men of stewardship. Of stewardship. They were good stewards of their wealth. Of their wealth. Verse number 11, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child and mother, his, and Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented them in the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They knew how to, they were stewards of their wealth. They said, here's the king of kings, here's the Lord of lords, here's the king of the Jews. And we come to worship him, and in worship him, they gave. They gave of their wealth. Why give? I think it's, in, it's indicated in the gifts that they gave. We're not going to spend a lot of time, but there's a lot of lessons in that. They gave gold. That's for royalty. For royalty, they gave gold. When people went to saw Solomon, they didn't give him cottage cheese. They gave him gold. Gold. They came and brought him gold. Why? Because he was the king. He was the mighty king. And they gave him gold. And so they gave gold for his royalty. He gave frankincense. That's a reverence of his office for prayer for our high priest. Out of reverence. We ought to give and be stewards because of reverence, because of his position, because he's the high priest. And murder because of his redemption. Redemption. Representing his body. Taking care of the body and Purifying the body, preparing the body for the funeral, his humanity. So they were stewards of their what class? Wealth. Wealth. Stewards of what class? Wealth. Their wealth, their money, their finances. Number two, they were stewards of their ways. Stewards of their ways. Notice what it says in Matthew two twelve. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Number one, they heeded God's warnings. They heeded God's warning. Remember King Herod says, when you find him, come tell me. I mean, the king, the most powerful king in the, in the whole area, said, when you find him, you come tell me. Now God says, no, don't you go tell him. He was warned. God gave him warnings. So they were steward of the ways, and they went home another way. They heeded God's warnings. There's some character for us. So they heed God's warnings. Don't ignore God's warnings. When God says you do this, you're going to suffer from it. Don't do this, you're going to fail. Do this, you're going to get hurt. Do it. We better heed his warnings. So they were good stewards of their ways, their life. They heeded God's warning. Number two, they obeyed God's will. More than Herod, they obeyed God. That's why we, as the apostle said in Acts 5, 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. I guarantee you, over the next few years, if Jesus carries his coming, we're going to get more and more opportunities to choose to obey God or man. It's just going to get more and more opportunities. And every time we decide to choose to obey man more than God, it's going to be harder next time to obey God. 
But I guarantee it, the more times we choose to obey God rather than men, the easier it's going to be to obey God next time. So they had King Herod and told them, he said, no. He said, you tell me. They said, no, we're going to obey God. So they were good stewards of their wealth, but of their ways. They heeded God's warning. They obeyed God's will. And I love this. They changed their own ways. They changed their own ways. Notice what it says. Verse 12, chapter 2. And being warned of God in the dream, they should not return to Herod. They departed in their own country another way. They changed their ways. That was not their plan. They're going to go back this way. They said, no, I think we're going to let God change how we're going to go home. We're going to change our ways. Change the way we're going to go. They departed another way. Let's let God change our ways. Yeah, I know a lot of Christians say, oh, this is the way I've always planned to do it this way. I'm not planning on changing. Oh, no, not to well, let God change your ways. Go home another way. By the way, it's always good to come to church and go home another way. To live another way. So tonight, how's our character molded? Is it molded by God? Can we learn from Simeon? Is our character molded based upon the cross? What's coming? What's coming? Are we like him? Let our character be based upon our past, the right way. The right way. Well, I said, preacher, I didn't come from a good home. All right, that's your character. Let God use that. Well, my marriage didn't turn out right.